when there's evidence that a win could take place or, there's, or that a success can be had, as the old phrase says, hope springs eternal. Well, our text this morning is a text about hope and confidence. It's a, hope, it's a text about what happens when we see and understand the objective external evidence about Jesus and what it says about our relationship to God and our relationship with one another. So let's stand together. We're going to read Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 together. And we're standing because we want to honor God's Word. We want to honor the God of the Word. And we want to stand to say we reverence what God is going to say to us this morning. So Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Let's read those. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father, we stand before your word because we believe it's your word, it's inspired, it's God-breathed, it's true, and we, your people, want to receive your word as truth. Truth is what God said, and we believe it. This morning, Lord, would you help us to adjust our lives to the objective truth that we find in these words of Scripture. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> One of the jobs of the preacher is to help you learn to study your Bible better. And my hope would be this, that when you are studying your Bible, that you're paying close attention because periodically you're going to notice that authors will utilize the same words or the same phrases over and over again. In the text that we have this morning in front of us, there are two particular words and phrases that are used over and over again, and they're just going to make up our outline. It really makes the job of the preacher pretty easy when you say, these are the words that are there, this makes up the outline, so we're just going to follow with what God's Word says. And the first word you're going to notice that is emphasized or repeated is its little word, since. And you're going to notice this in verses 19 through 21. Now, throughout the book of Hebrews... We have seen that the writer has been working to prove a point. He's been trying to say that Jesus is superior to anything that the old covenant or the old religion of the Jews had to offer. He's he's showing us that Jesus is a superior messenger, a superior deliverer, and he oversees a superior covenant. Now these are all Old Testament type of languages to help us see why is Jesus so beautiful? Why is he so amazing? And writing to first century Hebrew Christians, he's trying to say to them, Jesus is, is superior to anything you've ever experienced. Now he's done this because these first century Jewish Christians were really discouraged. They had been beaten, they had been persecuted, and they were to the point of wanting to leave behind their belief in Jesus and go back to the old religion that they had grown up with. In a sense, the social pressure and the persecution they were under was making it very difficult for them to stay in Christ. That's why the writer in verse 19 begins this section of Scripture with that little word, therefore. It's like him saying, because Jesus is superior to the old covenant and because Jesus did what the old covenant could not do, namely giving us eternal forgiveness from God and opening up the doorway to meet with God eternally, listen, it proves something to us, the fact that Jesus is this great, glorious Savior. He is far superior. And one of the things our text tells us that it proves is that we have confidence to enter the holy place, by the blood of Jesus. Now by confidence, the writer means this, that we we don't have to cower in shame any longer. We don't have to enter the presence of God 
in condemnation anymore because of our sin. We don't have to wonder if God receives us or allows us to come into His presence. Rather, He says, we have confidence, assurance, hope, because our sins have been forgiven, knowing that God receives us into the presence of God by the blood of Christ. Now, the writer calls the entrance into the presence of God a new and a living way. You see that in your Bible? I love how the writer of Hebrews puts this. He says, by the new and living way. And the point he's making is that the entrance into the presence of God was new because it did not exist until Christ opened this doorway up by his own life. When Jesus came to the earth, he lived perfectly in our place. He died in our place. He rose again as our victorious Savior and opened up a brand new living way that we might have access to the Father eternally. And this point he's making is, it is it's new in that sense, but it's also living in the sense that it's presently active. See, contrasting it with the old covenant that was old and dead, meaning that it, it had shriveled up, it had run its course, it had, it had finally come to the place where it's over and the shadow of that old covenant pointing ahead to this new and living way and something new and living is now on the scene. That's the point he's making here. His point is that old covenant was not new, was not living, but this new covenant opens up this new and living way and we have access or confident access to enter the presence of God because Jesus has gone before us. The entrance into the presence of God is alive and well because it was paved with the blood of Christ. That's his point. But he also says another fact in this paragraph that's going to impact the way we relate with God and one another. And he just says this, we also have a great high priest over the house of God. Now this is very significant in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has been trying to lay out this fact that Jesus is superior to every point of the Old Covenant. One of the points of the Old Covenant was this. Is Jesus a better high priest than the line of Aaron? And what the writer of Hebrews has done is he says, yes, he is far superior. The line of Aaron is earthly and temporal, but Jesus' line is eternal and heavenly. The line of Aaron had to go and offer a sacrifice for their own sin because they were sinful people. But the line of Jesus, this this eternal heavenly line, does not need to offer any sacrifice for himself. Rather, he gives himself as the sacrifice. He also says that Jesus' line of priesthood is so, so worthy that his work is finished and done because he's now seated at the right hand of God where he rests from his work But Aaron's line had to always work day after day, reminding us you're still in your sins because your priest is still working. And his point is simply this, that Jesus' priestly line is so, so superior that he oversees a superior covenant with superior promises that promise you forgiveness of sin and access to God. So here you have these since statements, verses 19 through 21 since we have confidence to enter by the blood of Jesus, and since Jesus is our great high priest, these are these, it's, it's like these little sin statements are ingredients that make up a cake, right? The ingredients are what makes the cake. You, you put all the ingredients in, and it's like the writer's saying, since Jesus is this, since he's done this, what do you do once you put the ingredients into the cake and you bake it and it comes out of the oven? What's next to do? You eat it. Right? If you don't eat it, you're weird, and I don't know why you made the cake, right? You put all the ingredients in, mix it together, and then you bake it and pull it out. The writer says this, here's the ingredients to the Christian life. Jesus has given you access to God forever. Jesus is your great high priest forever. Now what do you do with that? So verses 20 through 25, 20 through 25, in the rest of the text, is going to tell us what we do with this truth. See, here's the thing you've got to see about the book of Hebrews. This is a major transitional section. Throughout the entire book, here's what we've seen. I want to prove to you over and over and over again that Jesus is better than anything the Old Covenant had to offer. So at every point, haven't we? We've sat back and worshipped Jesus because he's so 
beautiful and glorious and heavenly and eternal and good and superior to anything else that is there. At this point of the book, the writer stops and says, okay, I've proven the point significantly. It is above and beyond the proof that Jesus is superior. Now, here's how you go act with it. Here's what you do with it. And so then he's going to give us another repetitive phrase that you see three times in this little text. And it's a little phrase, let us. It's like, um, I, I, I love math. I know I'm not, people go, really, math, Dave, you? Yeah, I, I like math. I, I especially like the, the, um, the statements of, if this happens, then this happens. I'm a logical thinker, so I like to know if, then statements. Here's the if, then statement. If Jesus is our great high priest, if Jesus has offered us eternal access into the Father, then what? Another, another way to put it is, since Jesus is all of this, how should we then live on the basis of this truth? Now, here's the challenge. If we pull out the let us statements, apart from the since statements, we lose the power and the authority to do the let us statements. They become nothing more than behaviorisms, moralisms, a few little rules you got to obey. But if you put the sin statements with the let us statements, you've got the power and the authority to do the let us statements. Does that make sense? Okay? Make sure that's clear. Okay? So we have three let us statements that we've got to see here. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, this section begins this application section, this kind of... Okay, what do we do with this truth that Jesus is this way? And the first one is, let us draw near. Now, one way to put this is, let us draw near to God with confidence that he receives us. This is remarkable news. And I'll explain it more as we go. But the implication of Jesus' superiority over the old covenant really is this point. And we cannot miss this. That there are no more barriers between us and God for all of eternity. I'm going to say that one more time so you can kind of let that settle in your soul. This hit me on Thursday after about two days in this text. This is your first time in the text. All right, I get it. So I'm going to try to give you my Thursday moment. It suddenly dawned on me that the way I view my relationship with God, again is on how I acted that day. And that God received me on the basis of whether or not I got up in the morning and had my private devotions, whether or not I treated my children appropriately or I loved on my wife rightly enough, or how I interacted with my staff when I got here or the people I was having meetings with. And I felt this little barrier at times of how does God view me in light of all of this? Do you see what the writer of Hebrews is saying? Uh, God operates on a completely different plane than you do and sees you completely differently than that. There are no more barriers between you and God because of the blood of Jesus. This is remarkable news that God is no longer stiff-arming us and holding us at arm's length. God does not reject us anymore because of our sin. He's not angry with us anymore. Rather, according to Scripture, He is good, loving, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love toward those who trust in Christ as their Savior. So the writer tells us what? Draw near to God with confidence that He receives you. Go to Him. But but how do you go to Him? You go to Him, he says, with full assurance of faith that you're clean. And that, that's, that's remarkable news. I mean, I don't know what keeps you from pursuing the Lord. I know what keeps me from pursuing the Lord. It's when I feel a little dirty. I feel shameful for something I've done. I remember as a youth pastor, um, struggling with some areas of sin, came into church, had to sit. We all, the pastor always wanted me to sit right in the front row. All the youth were behind me. And I could not even look the pastor in the face because I felt so shameful. And I, and I remember thinking, this is how God wants me to be, this shamed, 
And I struggled to look at the text and say, it, what kept me from pursuing God was my sense of shame and guilt. Yet what does the writer say to us? Because we can enter God's presence by the blood of Jesus, and because Jesus is our great high priest, listen clearly now, we have full confidence that we are clean and forgiven. God does not grant this kind of access to just anybody around who doesn't trust Him. This is access, unlike any other, to those who trust in Christ. Now this is good news because, again, if you're like me, you battle with your own sin. I'm my own worst critic. Um, my elders will tell me regularly, hey, don't own more of, your, of the sin that is not yours. They know me well enough to know that I, I will many times just fall on the sword and just, all right, look, I'll just admit that all this around me, I, I, I did all this. And they go, no, some of that stuff you didn't do. Don't admit to more of it than you need to. My point is, I, I see myself so remarkably sinful. When we read, sing songs like, apart from the grace of God, you know, I would be this guy. I know that in my soul. I think a lot of us feel that way. We're our own worst critic. We see our sins way up there and Jesus kind of way down here a little bit. Our enemies deride us and speak against us and tell us what horrible people we might be. And there becomes this sense of, is that who I really am? And look at this power of the objective truth of Christ, what it does to you. God sees us as washed, clean, and forgiven. Now, now just step for a moment and go into the, if you can, into the heavenlies for a moment and consider who this is speaking. The God of the universe who knows your every thought, was there when you did every, your very first sin, the moment you breathe, by the way, and he was there for every, every thought, every deed, every, ca- every careless word. The God of the universe who knows you to be more sinful than anybody else in the entire universe knows about you looks upon you, if you're in Christ, through the blood of Christ and says... I see you as clean and forgiven and accepted. Now come to me. It's simply remarkable news that Jesus has gone so ahead of us and has so satisfied the wrath and the curse of God that God sees us no longer in our sin. Milton Vincent in that great little book called The Gospel Primer put it this way. The gospel reminds me that my righteous standing with God always holds firm regardless of my performance. Because my standing is based solely on the, on the work of Jesus and not mine. On my worst days of sin and failure, the gospel encourages me with God's unrelenting grace towards me. And on my best days of victory and usefulness, the gospel keeps me relating to God solely on the basis of Jesus' righteousness and not mine. Now that's what you call good news. That's good news. And we all need to be reminded of this. We all need this reminder because our our consciences condemn us. Others around us deride us and hurt us. And our consciences will try to keep us from drawing near to God because of our sin. They'll say things like, how dare you? You're a Christian, you do that? You think God would accept somebody like you? Why would you ever pray to God for help when you need it, when you know that you're such a sinner? Maybe you don't think that way. That goes on in my life a lot. The battlegrounds I fight. We need his help and his support in this world. And what does our sin and our guilt and our condemnation try to do? Keep us away from the very one who can help us. Friends, listen, we all need a relationship with God through Christ more than any other relationship in this this world or this universe. Because God is the only all-knowing, always-present, all-powerful friend who sticks close to you in success or defeat. He alone is the only all-sufficient, all-caring friend. And listen, if your sin has kept you from pursuing God, let it keep you from Him no longer. Listen, if you're you're here this morning and you've not trusted Christ, and and maybe it's just simply that fact, you know, man, the things I've done, there's no way God could ever 
forgive me or cleanse me or whatever that may be. Maybe that's where you're at in your life. Let, let, that, let that falsehood leave you right now. In this truth that Jesus Christ and Him alone can cleanse you from your sin and all of your unrighteousness and accept you before God. Jesus, as Dan said earlier, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. So listen, today, you can trust in Christ, and you can have that slate wiped clean, if you will. But if you're like me, you've been a Christian, you've been going at it for a long time, and maybe you kind of begin to feel like, man, there's this, there's this drifting in my relationship with God. I, I see my prayer life is lacking. I don't study scriptures anymore. And certainly, you know what, my relationship with God, I just don't want to pursue him. I, I feel this tug every Sunday or community group week or even when I think about having personal devotions, you just kind of slide away and get out the back door and kind of hope that God doesn't see me. And maybe it's because you feel like too that maybe your sin has kept you from God, that you just kind of feel like that loser Christian. You know, like, I'm just, I'm just bad. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do well. God sees me as a sinner. Maybe God looks upon me for something I did in my past. Can I just say this to you? This text tell us, tells us you don't have to do that anymore. That you can draw near to God with a heart of full assurance because Jesus has gone before you. Now, you can see what this objective truth does to you. It says something beyond your feelings, your emotions, and even what your heart seems to say about yourself. It says something about God's work through Jesus on your behalf. And what does it do? It reminds you again that you are clean, God sees you, and it tells you to do what? Go to Him. Draw near to God. Now the second implication in the text is found in verse 23, and it's connected to the first one. He says, then let us hold fast... Our confession of hope without wavering. And he adds this little phrase. For he who promised is faithful. See, if we were simply to try to hold on to our confession that Jesus is superior without knowing that God is faithful, we would fumble that just as sure as Russell Wilson will throw an interception in the biggest moment of the Super Bowl. We will. That's a cheap shot to Russell Wilson, and I'm okay with that because I'm not a Seahawks fan. We'll do that. We will fumble it. Because why? The objective truth of who Jesus is, who God is, affects this in our soul. But notice the connection with our relationship with God and our understanding of His faithfulness. We can hold tight We cannot let go of the fact that Jesus is superior to all others because He who promised is faithful. A few weeks ago, Dan Seeker preached here and he said this, and I hope that you wrote this in your notes. He said this, Hope equals knowing the character of God. If God is watered down in our thinking, we will lose hope. But God never disappoints. But God never disappoints because he who promised is faithful because Jesus has entered the presence of God through his blood because he is our faithful high priest then do what hold on to it see that's his point hold on to this don't let go of it cling tightly to this truth that Jesus is superior to all others and listen don't you need this reminder we all need it We all need this reminder in a world that's constantly trying to rub the shine off the glory of God. Just trying to keep you from losing, to keep you from gaining sight into God's faithfulness and goodness. Always questioning whether or not God is trustworthy. Do you really trust a God who, if He's good, He wouldn't allow evil in this world? And these statements sound so philosophical and so big and so brash that they cause our hearts to flutter and wonder, is God faithful? What does the writer of Hebrews say? He who promised is faithful. There's there's no doubt in his mind. As a young lad growing up in the church, I had a dear friend of mine who every about every month of my life said this phrase and this question, David, what is truth? And I would reply back, truth is what God says. said it over and over and over and over again. 
to the point I'm still repeating it to you. Truth is what God says. When God says He is faithful, then guess what? God is faithful. He's faithful. And this reminder is so critical because your world is pressing in with every sense of pressure and persecution and suffering and trial to simply try to say to you, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's not faithful as all, at all. But since he who promised is faithful, what else are we to do than to trust him? Don't you love in John 6, there's that story where Jesus tells this hard saying, when people say, what should we do? And he says, you know, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't be a, a, a disciple of mine. And it says, and from that moment on, people begin to leave him. He turned and he looked at the disciples and he says, are you two going to leave? And Peter, in these great words, just says, Lord, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You know what he said there? You alone are faithful. Where else am I going to go? Where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go to find that the, the more superior, the more glorious one in the universe, he is it. Where else are we going to go? That's his point. See, here, here's the deal. In order to know that God is faithful, what do you got to do? You, you got to draw near. <laughs> See the connection? You, you got to know him a little bit. It's like, like Lucy, the little girl in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. At one point, she needed to get near to Aslan and rub her hands through his mane. Right? We need to draw near to God as welcome children of our Father who cares for us. He's faithful whether we draw near to Him or not, but our drawing near to Him helps us experience and see and know and believe His faithfulness. Is He a tame lion? Oh no. But a faithful one? Yes and amen. Absolutely. And knowing His faithfulness will cause us to do what? Not, not, lose, not lose our grip. Parents, listen school you're starting my my hope is this that we we will not simply give our children a list of commandments to just don't do oh no they will help them to draw near to this faithful god to know him so listen they won't lose their grip you don't help them not lose their grip or help them hang on to these truths tightly by just giving them commandments no you give them the superiority glorious nature of god and the wonder of christ and what that does, it causes their hearts to marvel at who He is. And you know what they want to do then? Keep His commandments. Let's be people who are holding close. Let us not lose our grip on this confession of hope. Last implication, verses 24 and 25, is a pretty famous one. And it's this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. Or another way to put it is, let us draw near to one another. Now, it's clear throughout the, the book of Hebrews that the writer is writing to a community of people. See, this is where I, I, I radically agree with Dan that Christianity is a, you, we've got to see these things personally. But there is as well, and Dan will agree with this as well, the personal aspect will have a corporate expression. That they'll be around people that can observe and see and watch and know and help and encourage and exhort and teach and all those kind of things... And that's what the writer of Hebrews has done. If we're not careful, we think that he wrote this book to one Hebrew. No, it's Hebrews, plural, group of people. You read any of the books of the New Testament, save Philemon and Jude, 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, Titus, they're all written to what? Groups of people, communities of saints. And he's writing this because it's so critical to know what they're going through. They're being persecuted for their faith. They're scared to death. They don't want to come out of their homes. Many of them have lost their homes, which we're going to study about next week. Many of them have lost even their own loved ones, and they're terrified to come out of their homes. They're terrified to go, if you will, unite with the saints around them, because if they do, it could cost them their lives. Now, what I find intriguing is that you would think he would say something like this. Draw near to God, and since the persecution is so bad and scary out there, Man, just protect yourselves. Guard your children, raise them up in your home, disciple them well, and as you've done, as you do that, that'll protect the faith. But that's not what he does, is it? He says, no, draw near to God, don't lose your hope, your grip on that confidence you have in Christ, and then draw near to one another. In other words, he says it this way, don't make it less known that you're a child of God, make it more known. 
Don't make it less known that you're connected with the people of God. Make it more known. And notice what he does. He says, consider how to stir each other up to love and good deeds. You know why that's important? Love and good deeds are the the covering, the clothing that we put on our faith. You and I can say all day long we believe in Jesus. It's true. Our verbal expression and proclamation of the gospel matters. It matters a lot. From Romans 10, nobody comes to faith except to us proclaiming it. But do you know what a declarative work of our faith is? Our love and good deeds. Right? We can proclaim the gospel and be a jerk and be hateful and spiteful and mean. And that says something about the power of God, doesn't it? Or we can proclaim the gospel and then through our life and through the way we live, declare it through love and good deeds. Now notice what he's doing here. He's saying to the people here, don't isolate yourselves in a little small holy huddle. Be in the world and learn how to look at each other and find out how can I encourage this person to go out and express their faith in a world that's terrifying. I mean, imagine that, that you could do a Christian deed and it might cost you your life. And so he says to them what? Do, don't, don't, don't pull back. Push in. Now the connection to this is intriguing because then he says, also, consider how to stir up one another, not neglecting to meet together. Now again, think about this. You're walking down the road with your children to go to church. And a threat comes upon the horizon and says, if you enter that building... It will cost you your life. What's your tendency? Okay, go back home. Right? It's hard enough to make sure we're regular in community life without persecution. Imagine it with persecution. See, some had made it a habit that because of the threats around them, just to stay away. And what does the writer of Hebrews say? Not neglecting to meet as is the habit of some. But he says encouraging one another all the more day after day as you see the day drawing near. See what his point is? His point is again, don't don't pull back from the body of Christ in these days. Push in to the body of Christ. And you notice the words he uses. Consider is the word that's used. And that word means to motivate. Find out how you can motivate one another to love and good deeds. You can't do that without being in proximity. Right now we can do it through texting today and through email and all the stuff that goes with that. And But I tell you this, there's nothing like sitting down eyeball to eyeball with somebody and having them encourage you. Nothing like it. To motivate you, to encourage you, to inspire you, to push you forward to motivate you to this. Now what you notice is, this is really remarkable. Since Jesus is our great high priest, since he's given access to the presence of God and offered forgiveness of sins, let us draw near to one another. Why? Why does that from the gospel to connect, why is it to connect us to one another? Here's just a few thoughts. It's a reminder that we're not alone. I need this. You need this. You know, you stay-at-home moms or you moms are raising new babies and you've got kids and it feels like that, you know, once they get to two years old, it's like, did demon possession just take over? I mean, what happened here? And suddenly you're raising everything up off your shelves and now your shelves, you know, all the stuff, the books are like eight feet high now off the ground. All your vases are put up and people walk in and go, that's a pretty vase up there. Why is it there? My kids, man. I mean, they just scale walls and pull stuff down. And it just feels like you're pulling your hair out every moment. You know what you need? You need one another. You need to be reminded you're not alone. You know what you need? You need an older lady who went through it, has gone through it, been there to say, you're not ruining your children. You love them, right? Yes. I'm right here with you. You need that. You know what guys like me and guys like you in the business world need? You need to know you're not alone. Because you're going into a world tomorrow morning where you're going to be around people all day long. It's going to feel like you're losing your mind. Wondering, does Jesus reign supreme anywhere? And it's a reminder that we're not alone. It's a reminder that God is real. Because you see God working in people's lives. 
And you just go, wow, this isn't just me. God's working in that person and this person. That's a miraculous thing. And it gives you hope and confidence that the power of God can help you grow, overcome sin, and live in love toward other people when you feel like you can't. It's motivating, isn't it, to your service of Christ. It's like coming to headquarters, right, before you head out to the war. It's like taking a leave of absence from the battlefield to just be with your family, get some strength and some rest. It's a source of encouragement because the world can be so ridiculously discouraging. I mean, if you don't, if you don't want to be, if you don't want to be discouraged, don't turn the news on at night. I mean, you open the newspaper and you just go, my goodness, man, is Donald Trump for real? I mean, you just, am I, am I living a nightmare? I mean, what am I looking at? And you're just like, that, that's the guy that we're going to go, woo! And I'm like, no, what are we doing? It just, uh, and that makes me question, I, I, never mind, I, I, I could go there, but I'm not. Okay, it's a, it's a source of encouragement in a world of discouragement, all right? Right, I get it. Everybody, I, he's better than one. Okay, let's stop there, okay. All right, <clears throat> I get it, I get it. Not to mention this, most importantly of all, here's what our meeting does and our gathering together. It's an expression of heaven. Are you, are you aware of that, that when you're having coffee or you're hanging out with Christian friends, or your community group, or you're having a Bible study, or you come together to church on Sunday, you are expressing to the world out there, heaven matters to me. It matters to me. It's an expression of the glory of God like nothing else on this earth, where people from every background, every age experience, uh, all gather under one banner, and his name is Jesus, to worship him. My point is this, drawing near to one another is a unique means of God's grace in our lives and one that we must apply. It's like him saying this, draw near to God is non-negotiable. Don't let hold of your confidence, non-negotiable. Draw near to one another, non-negotiable. Now see, we take the first two and kind of go, yeah, non-negotiables. The last one we go, ah, not so much. I can kind of sway and choose whenever I want and do my thing. It's because you're American and you're independent and you do that. That's not how the Bible's working here. In a sense, what he's saying is, if we're not connecting in community on a regular basis, we're not applying a key means of grace from the gospel in our lives. So here's a clear implication. Since Jesus has opened the presence of God for us, since he is our great high priest, fellowship with the people of God. Fellowship with him. And this is a great timing right now for us to do this. Very, very appropriate time of the year, right? I mean, summer is over next Sunday, Labor Day weekend. Theoretically, it's over today because tomorrow, everybody knows, school starts, right? I talked to kids, been sleeping until 10, and they're like, oh man, six o'clock is going to come like, ugh, right? And at moms and dads tonight, everybody's in bed at eight, kind of doing that thing. Summer's over, the running begins to stop, and routine begins to kick in. They go, wait a minute, school's running, I don't know, man. Summer to me is crazy, right? It's crazy. Vacations for summer over. I say for some because mine's coming. (laughs) Yeah. And school is beginning. Here's the point. Regular life, regular rhythm is about to hit. So let me just challenge you with something. As it's happening, make community life part of that rhythm. I'm not just talking about being here every Sunday. That People get that in their mind. No. Make community life part of your rhythm of life. Make it part of who you are. One of the beauties is next Sunday, we'll be highlighting for every Sunday in September just different avenues to get involved in the community of saints here through Bible studies, you know, community groups, Bible reading groups, church services, obviously, little kids groups that you can join up with your kids and be a part of, teen groups, all those kind of things to just connect. Why? Here, here's why I think it's important. The, the, the Bible says so. What is truth? Truth is what God says. So what do we do with God's truth? We adjust our lives to the news. We don't debate it. We say, Lord, what do you have for me? Draw near to God. Hold fast your confession of hope without wavering. And draw near to one another. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for teaching us this morning. I know that as, as one who has felt like I've run with my tongue hanging out most of the summer, I, I'm grateful for rhythm. So Lord, help us as, as rhythm begins, help us most importantly to draw near to you. And I pray for my friends here today. I, I, I pray for the one the ones here today who don't know you and they they feel like they're a long way off from you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help them see that there is cleansing and power and forgiveness in the blood of Christ this morning. Let them trust Jesus. I pray for the Christian who has felt a long way off from God. Father, would you draw them near to yourself? I pray for my brothers and sisters as they go into the world tomorrow. Lord, help them to hold fast the confession of hope without wavering tomorrow. Not not in their own strength, but knowing this, that you who promised is faithful. And Father, as we begin to get in the rhythm, help the rhythm of community life be a part of our DNA. Let us love you well and love each other well. Let us love our community well. Let the hope of the gospel of Christ and the, the love of our, of our Savior be evidenced by the fact that we love each other. We care for each other. And we encourage each other all the more as we see the day drawing near. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.